Concerning our seventh chapter, Romans 7, Reckoning, it might be well for us to turn to Romans 7 in our Bibles, and we'll begin at verse 1. Actually, the seventh chapter of Romans has mainly to do with the law and the Christian's relationship to the law. We want to remember, uh, first of all, the purpose for God's law. In Romans 3.20, Paul said that by the law is the knowledge of sin. And God uh, presented the law to Israel to show them that they were sinners. He put the standard so high that they were unable to uh, attain to it or maintain it. And it caused them to realize their weakness and sinfulness. And that's the basic purpose for the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. And we want to see here uh, how God brings us out in Romans 7. Where he says, Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. And then he gives us an illustration. For the woman who hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she, sh she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from the law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law, <clears throat> by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. <clears throat> well, this fourth verse is, uh, holds a lot for us. When did we become dead to the law? Well, he explains there by the body of Christ uh, in our identification with the Lord Jesus Christ. When he died unto sin, he also died unto the law. Because the law says the wages of, wages of sin is death. And the Lord Jesus was made to be sin on our behalf and the law slew him. He went down into death. But the law could go no further than that. That really fulfilled the law. And the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead, and the law had no more claim on him. He was in, on the ground of pure grace. And that, of course, is exactly where every Christian is, in the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, the relationship of the Lord Jesus to the law is our relationship to the law. That's what Paul is seeking to show here in these first verses. The law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Well, the Christian has died in Christ, and therefore the law has no more dominion over us. That we're on the ground of grace in our Lord Jesus. The law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is a wonderful thing to see because uh, most uh, most Christians today are they they aren't under the, the the law, the Mosaic law, but they're under the principle of law for the most part. They feel they should do things in order to live a Christian life, and they shouldn't should do good things and shouldn't do bad things in order to maintain their Christian life and. It's a matter of a, it's a matter of being under the principle of law. They must do this and mustn't do that. And of course, uh, that's exactly how we find out how weak we are: is trying to produce and trying not to do the wrong thing. 
And the law crosses us, crosses us up every time, and we realize that we fail. And that's what uh, we're going to see the picture of that in this in this chapter seven. The futility of seeking to keep the law, or seeking to live the Christian life under the principle of law. Wherefore, my brethren, ye are also become dead to the law by the body of Christ. He freed us from the domination of the law, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that ye should bring forth fruit unto God. Now, we cannot bring forth fruit in our lives by the principle of law. The fruit of the Christian life is the fruit of the Spirit, and the Holy Spirit works on the ground of grace. He works on the ground of uh, spiritual growth and not on the ground of uh, self, the self-effort of the law. That we should bring forth fruit unto God and uh, that he should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead. And marriage, uh, marriage in the natural is a picture of oneness. When a man and, one, a man, a man and woman are married, before God, they become uh, as one. And uh, the Christian who is born again, born into the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the Lord Jesus becomes his life. And uh, they, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. One spirit with him. And his life is our life. And there is that uh, eternal oneness. Uh, for to me to live is Christ. Christ, who is our life. And this is a wonderful picture of what happened to us in our identification with the Lord Jesus. And then verse 5, For when we were in the flesh, the sinful impulses, or emotions of sin, as the King James Version has it, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Before we were saved, when we were in the flesh, so to speak, when we were living in the fleshly Adam, uh, all of our works, none of our works could God, uh, God could accept, and all of our works brought forth sin. It brought forth uh, fruit unto death, sin for fruit, the works of the flesh. And that same uh, nature is within our body, uh, Christians, as Christians, and uh, if we rely upon self, if we yield to the old nature, if we yield to self, uh, the works of the flesh are going to come forth and be manifested. <clears throat> and uh, if, as Christians, we seek to keep the law, and if we seek to live our Christian life on the basis of law, all that we're going to be able to produce is the sinful fruit, the works of the flesh. That's all the law can produce. And God cannot honor that, and God is not uh, dealing with us uh, on the basis of law any longer. He's dealing with us on the basis of grace and on the basis of life, the life of the Lord Jesus. So in verse 6, but now we are delivered from the law. Now how are we delivered from the law? Because we died to the law in the Lord Jesus at Calvary. Dead to the law. That being dead in which we were held, and the actual meaning there, having died to that which we were held, we died to the domination of sin, the reign of sin that was holding us prisoner. And we have died to the grip of the law, which uh, its chief function was to show us how sinful we were. And we have died to that, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter, that we should live and serve in the Holy Spirit, and uh, that he should work in our spirit and produce the fruit of the Spirit, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and that we're not to uh, serve and live in the oldness of the letter or the oldness of the law. And this is a wonderful thing for us to see. Now there's a thought in uh, 2 Corinthians 3 here that we might trace a bit about the newness of the spirit and the oldness of the letter in 2 Corinthians 3 6 who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament not of the letter but of the spirit for the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life and there's a note here in our Schofield right below that in our Schofield Bible where it says the letter is a Paulism for the law as spirit is a passage in his word for the relationships and powers of new life in Christ Jesus and uh, this passage here in chapter 3 is a series of contrasts between law and spirit between the old covenant and the new covenant Two methods of in, uh, they're not two methods of interpretation, literal and spiritual, but between two methods of divine dealing, one through the law and the other through the Holy Spirit. And since we have died to the law, God doesn't deal with us any longer by law. He deals with us by His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who lives within our spirit, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth but the Spirit giveth life, and, and that's, that was the work of the law, to kill. The law showed us our sinfulness, and the wages of sin is death. And the law brings death, but uh, the Spirit gives life. And then uh, Paul gives this wonderful contrast between the law and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit. But if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be more glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory, in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. Uh, the glory of the Holy Spirit is so glorious that uh, even the glory of the law is, is, is as nothing. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have uh, such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Uh, and not as Moses, who put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. Uh, Moses' face shone when he came down from the mount with the law uh, so brilliantly that he had to cover his face with a veil. And even uh, all of that brilliance was uh, because of a law, and a law that was to end. A law that brought forth death, not life. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses has read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Well, what is there uh, whenever, wherever the law is? There's bondage. The tremendous contrast, even the glorious, even the spiritual law, the law that was holy, uh, its function was to bring forth death, and to reveal death and sin. And glorious as that was, the real glory is the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And in the liberty that the life of the Lord Jesus gives. Liberty to live... Uh, as God wants us to live, as we grow. 
liberty to uh, fulfill the law and, and uh, go beyond the law. The law calls uh, a man to walk an extra mile for someone, but uh, the liberty of the Spirit enables a man to walk much further than that from his heart, in love, not because uh, a written statute tells him that he must. So then uh, Paul brings forth this wonderful verse, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And he gives a contrast here, he, he tops off this contrast of these verses by this tremendous uh, final verse that the Israel as they looked upon Moses and uh, looked upon the law they were blinded uh, and they couldn't understand anything about the Lord Jesus Christ all they could understand was their sinfulness but when the Holy Spirit comes on the ground of grace as we look upon um, the Lord Jesus, who is the embodiment of grace, we're changed into his image as we look upon his glory. We're not uh, blinded, we're not crippled, we're not kept away from him, but we are drawn to him and we're made like him. And this is done by the Spirit of the Lord, by the Holy Spirit. As we study him in the Word and get to know him better and... Uh, fellowship with him all the time there's something going on deep within us where the Lord Jesus is more fully manifesting himself in our lives that we're being uh, effortlessly conformed to his image simply by uh, abiding in him and uh, feeding upon him and uh, looking at him and uh, fellowshipping with him through the word through uh, our prayer fellowship with him so this uh, this contrast is brought out here in Second uh, Corinthians three, that Paul is mentioning in um, our Romans seven six. Now we are delivered from the law, that being dead in which we were held, that being dead to which we were held, having died to that which we were held, that makes the sense of it, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. And you remember in our Romans 6, verse 13, Yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and that we should walk in newness of life. The same thought here, in serving. We serve in the newness of spirit, not in the oldness of the letter of uh, doing things because we should, because we must, because it's expected of us, no. But because we uh, love the Lord Jesus and we want to allow him to carry out his work through us. We become obedient, uh, pliable servants, instruments in his hands. The, the unspeakable privilege of uh, allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to use us uh, for, uh, for his purposes. And uh, the only purposes that he has are those to glory the fa glorify the Father. And then in verse uh, 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known covet coveting, except the law said thou shalt not covet. And there is the ministry of the, uh, the law, the wonderful ministry of the law, to show us our need. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of coveting. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Apart from the law, we, we're not aware of sin. The law shows us our sinfulness. And the principle of law shows us our weakness and sinfulness, our inability to uh, live for the Lord Jesus. And that's uh, how Paul began to uh, understand about the true law and about the work of the Holy Spirit. For in verse 9 he says, For I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. 
and uh, as a as an unsaved uh, Israelite before Paul was saved, he he thought that the law, he thought keeping the law was going to give him life. And of course, he he kept the law uh, not in a spiritual way, but in a mechanical way. He met certain conditions, and he felt that he was righteous, and it was self righteousness that he didn't uh, commit adultery. Therefore, he was all right in that realm. But uh, of course, when the Lord Jesus came and and uh, Paul saw that the law was spiritual. Uh, even the very thought in that direction was adultery. Even even uh, thinking it wrong it wasn't a matter of just doing. So that Paul realized that he uh, the law slew him. He realized that he was under the law, and uh, he realized his sinfulness. Sin revived, and I died. He realized that he was a lost sinner. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. The law didn't, uh, it wasn't the law's fault, it was uh, sin, uh, the law was simply uh, pointing out the sin. The law didn't make Paul a sinner. Paul was a sinner, and the law showed him the fact. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might be exceedingly sinful. Uh, Paul's very attempt to live for God and obey God, uh, seeking to do good, was the very thing that turned it, turned around and showed him that he was uh, no good. Showed him his uh, terrible sinfulness is inability to uh, live for God. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. And the law showed Paul his true condition in himself. The fleshly, soulish, Adamic nature was revealed to Paul by the holiness of the law. And then comes this realm of Romans 7 that we're all so familiar with. F uh, in verse 15, For that which I do, I understand not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. And every growing Christian is aware of this fact. that the harder he tries to live for God, the more he fails. And the harder he fights against the power and reign of sin within, the more, the tighter a grip of sin gets upon him. And the more he seeks to succeed, the more he fails. And this is the law carrying out its holy ministry, uh, preparing us as Christians to allow the Lord Jesus Christ to live his life through us and uh, to uh, cause us to cease trying to live Christian life for him or with his help. The ministry of the law to the Christian. <coughs> In verse 16, If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Now here, Paul, as a Christian, is saying that he's a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he doesn't want to sin. He's fighting against sin. So that he says, if I'm doing that which I don't want to do, it's not me that's doing it, but it's sin that's in me. It's a self-life loose to uh, the old life which is dominating and producing the works of the flesh and the new life uh, the new the, the new life in Christ Jesus the, the Christian life the young growing life that life loves the Lord Jesus that that's the life of the Lord Jesus and that life doesn't want to sin that life uh, can't sin 
But when uh, Paul, as a new creation in Christ Jesus, uh, submits to the old life, that which ye uh, yield yourselves servants to, you become the servants of. When he yields to the old life, why well, sin, sin is uh, committed. And he doesn't realize yet that he has been freed from the old life, so he doesn't realize that he can turn from it and rely upon the new life, Re rely upon his true Christian life. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. He's learning that, and we have to learn that. And the only way we learn that is through failure. Years of failure, time and time again, we finally realize that in ourselves, even our good points, uh, there's no good thing, nothing acceptable to God. And in time, none of it becomes acceptable to us. In me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And when we're born again, we are born into Christ, and he becomes our life, and we have the mind of Christ. We have the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mind of the new life is the mind of the Lord Jesus, and the attitude of the Lord Jesus. We have the, the will, we have the, the bent, and we have the love of God, and uh, we want to live for God. But even though we're born again, in ourselves, uh, we don't have the power to carry out that will. And the power is in the Holy Spirit. The power is in the Spirit of Christ. The power is in the new life. And as we learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit, as we learn to abide in the Lord Jesus Christ, He supplies the power that carries out the new will. When we long to live for Him, the Holy Spirit lives the life of the Lord Jesus through us. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. And that's why so many Christians are terribly frustrated. They love the Lord Jesus, they want to live for him, they want to serve him, they want to have a good testimony, and they just continually fail. And they're so aware of uh, sin and self within, and uh, they get into situations where sin is manifested. Well, we have the new will from the day we're born again, but we don't have the uh, strength and uh, maturity to carry that will out as yet because uh, as young Christians because we haven't learned how to avoid the old life how to avoid the domination of self we haven't learned how to really abide in the Lord Jesus and truly depend upon him and walk in the Holy Spirit in dependence upon him where he supplies the ability to carry out the new will because the Christian life is a dependent life we can't uh, get saved and take off on our own and be a hero for God? Not at all. Uh, all this is for God's glory, that he might be glorified in all things. That's why he saved us in the first place. And we have the wonderful privilege of uh, resting in him and depending upon him and seeing him work. And he uses our bodies and he uses our mind and he uses our heart and he uses our experience. He uses our talents when he chooses to. He uses us so that it's actually, uh, we're, we're, we're doing it, we're carrying it out. It's, it, it's actually that, and yet it's carried out by the new life within, the life of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we're one with him. For to me to live is Christ. And then verse 19, For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. And here he hasn't found out the secret yet, and this is what his, this is what his life consists of. He longs to do good, but he can't. And he hates to do evil, but that's what he does. And the life is up and down, uh, day by day, in and out, up and down, some of self and some of Christ, and uh, defeat after defeat. A few victories here and there, but they don't last. And it's the uh, defeated Christian life. Sad, poor testimony, heartbreaking, and yet, and yet, the very thing that our Father uses 
to take us from the self-centered life as a Christian to the Christ-centered life. The very process that's required for us to find out that uh, we cannot live by law, we must live by grace. We found out that we couldn't be saved by the law. We had to come uh, onto the ground of grace to be saved. And yet, uh, the minute we get saved, we feel that we have to keep the law or have the law, uh, law principle uh, binding us in order to live the Christian life. But uh, so that the, our Father has to take us all through a process again to teach us that uh, we're not only saved by grace, but we have, we li we're to live by grace. And we're saved by faith and we're to live by faith. And we're uh, saved by not using any effort, and we're to live by not using any effort. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. And that's the law of sin in our members. That's the law that the old life uh, produces nothing but sin. That's a law. It can't produce any good. There's no good thing in it. And that, that old life resides in our body. And it's free to produce sin. As long as we do not uh, reckon it to have been crucified, as long as we do not reckon ourselves as new creations in Christ to be dead unto the principle of sin and self. It's free to reign. So that we find there's a law there. That's a law. That when I would do good, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, after the new man, after the, the, the new life that we were recreated in, the life of the Lord Jesus, that life delights in the law of God. But we learn to hate the law of sin in our members. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So that we, the laws are there. There's a law of sin and there's a law of grace. There's a law of righteousness. It's the law of the Spirit in Christ Jesus within our bodies. And it's a matter of which law we yield to, whether we're going to bring forth sin or we're going to bring forth righteousness. And Paul cries out, finally, after he finds out about these laws within him, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And he's, he's fully aware now that uh, <clears throat> there's nothing but death in the old life. Brings forth sin, and sin bringeth forth death. And he also has found out, through hard experience, that uh, Christian though he is, new life that he has in himself as a new creature in Christ, he cannot overcome this law of sin in his life. He is not strong enough to overcome the power and the domination of the sin and the self-life within him. And that's what we have to find out. And so it isn't, he's not crying out, uh, how shall I get free from all this? He's finally uh, awakened and he's crying out that he is wretched. He realizes that he's wretched, but he says, who? Who shall deliver me from uh, the body of this death? Well, only the life can deliver from death, only the one who is life. And he realizes here in verse 25, and he thanks God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, that's, who, that's how he'll be delivered. That's who uh, will deliver him, and, and how will that be? Well, the fact that he's already been delivered, that he has been uh, taken down into death in the Lord Jesus Christ, identified with him and uh, brought up on resurrection ground in him. And the old life has been uh, crucified. This law of sin and its members has been crucified at the cross. And our verse in uh, Romans 6.11 is uh, calling 
uh, to Paul calling to the Christian to count upon these facts in order to uh, get the benefit of them. And his conclusion here in verse 25, So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And remember now that we as Christians have the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are able to choose the spiritual law of God, the, the law of the Holy Spirit, and depend upon Him, where uh, we might bring forth righteousness. And Paul says, but with his flesh, uh, he serves the law of sin. So that if we depend upon self, or if we depend upon uh, our own abilities in the flesh, no matter how good we do, it's going to bring forth sin because uh, all of that is under the law of sin. It has no other law, and it uh, cannot respond to any other law. That's the law of its being. The law of uh, the flesh is sin. It's all it can bring forth. So you see how important it is for us to find these things out. That we know where we stand, that we know what our position is, that we know what God has done about all this that's going on, the civil war that's going on in the, in the uh, struggling Christian's heart. That he, he finds out that he, um, it's no use warring against the flesh. Uh, not only because he can't win, but uh, the fact that uh, God has already dealt with the flesh at Calvary. I think that, uh, because there's such a close connection here between Romans 7 and Romans 8, some say that there shouldn't be a break here, there shouldn't be a beginning of a new chapter at all, that the thought should uh, keep right on going in the same chapter to help the student realize how closely connected these truths are. Well, we'll, we'll deal with it in that way so that we'll, it'll help us to see the continuity where Paul says that, uh, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. And in this first verse of Romans 8, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk uh, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And uh, the authorized version stops the verse right after in Christ Jesus. There's a period there. And they don't uh, include who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And this is true because that is an interpolation. That, that Those words, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, uh, go uh, belong in verse 4. That's where they are rightly related. If we leave them in verse 1, we have the wrong thought altogether. If we leave them in verse 1, then the verse says this, that there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus if they walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Uh, but our, our condemnation is not because of how we walk. Our condemnation is because of uh, being unsaved. But when we're in the Lord Jesus Christ, He, carry, he bore our condemnation. And in our, our relationship to Him doesn't depend upon how we walk. It depends upon our relationship, our, our life in Him. It depends upon His finished work. Many Christians read this first verse and say, well, uh, if I don't walk right, I'll be condemned. If I walk in the flesh, I'll be condemned. But that's not true because every Christian walks to some degree in the flesh, brings forth sin, and he's not uh, brought under condemnation for it. And even the Holy Spirit doesn't condemn him. The Spirit convicts him, but the Spirit points to uh, the shed blood in the Lord Jesus Christ in his intercession above, who uh, forgives the sin and cleanses him from all unrighteousness. He's not condemned. So we must leave the verse the way it belongs, and that is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, period. And then verse 2 tells us why. 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Well, we've been made free from the law of sin and death as far as condemnation goes by the fact that the Lord Jesus died on the cross for us, died for our sins. And we've also been made free in our daily walk from the law of sin and death by the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is our life and the fact that we were crucified, with the, we died unto sin in him and that the old life was crucified. And the law of the spirit of life is the law of that death and the law of that life. The Holy Spirit brings the death of Calvary into our daily experience, crucifying the old life, the self-life, and he brings the life of the Lord Jesus within us that the Lord Jesus might be manifested in our body. Those are the laws by which he works. He brings the finished work of death upon the old life, and he brings the finished work of life into the new life. For the law of spirit, of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We may not be fully experiencing that freedom, but as we grow, we experience more and more of it. That is more and more not I but Christ. And it's not through our personal efforts, not through our struggle, but through the law of the Spirit. And then in verse 3, Paul speaking of the law that we died to, he says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. The law couldn't make us holy. The law couldn't make us righteous. The law was holy, but we weren't. We were lost sinners. And because of uh, the sinfulness, our sinfulness, uh, the sinfulness of the flesh, we were unable to keep the law. And that's what the law, uh, that's the ministry of law to show us that. But God uh, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. And the, God is not seeking to patch up the old life, the flesh. He's not uh, asking us to uh, struggle to make it better. He condemned it. And we are to see that it has been condemned. And sin has been condemned. And uh, we do not have to obey it any longer. We can simply yield to our Father and uh, rest in the Lord Jesus Christ instead of struggle against the power of sin. And verse 4, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, if we walk after the flesh, if we depend upon the old life, and uh, depend upon self in our Christian life, uh, the law, once again, is going to show us how sinful we are. But if we learn to abide in the Lord Jesus and depend upon the Holy Spirit and walk after the Spirit, uh, we're going to see that the law is fulfilled in our daily life. Not by keeping the law, but by allowing the Holy Spirit to produce the righteousness of the Lord Jesus in our daily walk. And of course, His righteousness uh, far exceeds what the law calls for. The law calls that we might not commit adultery, but uh, the, the righteousness of the Lord Jesus keeps a person from even having adulterous thoughts. Far exceeds what the law called for. So that uh, the life of the Spirit of Christ far exceeds, uh, easily fulfills the law, what the law calls for, and goes beyond. And then in verse 5, For they that are after the flesh, uh, who walk after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, uh, the things of the Spirit. Well now, in our daily Christian life, uh, w what, is the, um, what is our heart reaching out for? Is it the old life seeking satisfaction in the world? Is it the new life seeking satisfaction in the Lord Jesus Christ, in glory? 
Are we fleshly or are we spiritual? Well, you say sometimes I'm one way and sometimes I'm another. Well, when we get sick, sick and tired of being fleshly, uh, we'll be more ready to walk after the Holy Spirit and depend upon Him and to realize what He wants to us and bring us off from the old life, the fleshly life. And then here in our car, in our uh, King James Version, we have uh, trouble here in verse 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And uh, actually the uh, authorized version says in um, verse 6, for the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. Whereas King James says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Well, the authorized is correct that the mind of the flesh, the bent, the uh, attitude and the thinking of the flesh brings forth death. It has nothing, it can produce nothing but death. Whereas the mind and the bent and the nature of the spirit is life and peace, a new life. And then he explains in verse 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And that is uh, the self-life, that it is at enmity against God. And of course, an enemy cannot be reconciled, a true enemy cannot be reconciled, and God did not seek to uh, reconcile the flesh. He crucified it. And we're not to seek to reconcile it. We're to counter it to be crucified. We're to reckon upon the fact that uh, the self-life was crucified at Calvary. And we're not to have anything to do with it. But our entire attention, our entire heart is to be centered in the Lord Jesus Christ, our new life. And that brings uh, life and peace. Life for others and peace for our hearts. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Well, if we're going to walk after the flesh, we cannot please God. That's certainly true. And those who are still in the flesh completely, uh, unsaved people who haven't been born again yet, they can't please God either. And then verse 9, he explains, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of, none of his. And we, uh, our new life is not in the flesh. We have been born again. We've been cut off from the flesh at Calvary, and we've been recreated in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're in the Spirit. We're in the Spirit of Christ. We're in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we were born again, the Holy Spirit came within our spirit to dwell forever. He shall, he shall dwell with you forever. And if we have the Holy Spirit, we're born again. And if the Holy Spirit is not within our spirit, we're not born again. We're not Christians at all. We're none of God's. We don't belong to God. We're still in the flesh, living in the uh, Adamic life. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And the wages of sin is death. And uh, when we're born again, we've passed through death. And the old life is held in the place of death because of the wages of sin. But uh, we have been uh, renewed, reborn in Christ, and uh, we have life because of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then this wonderful promise in verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also give life to your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And that's a promise that um, we're going to receive our, our new bodies through the Holy Spirit because he dwells within us when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. Therefore, brethren, uh, so he's really speaking not only of the present, but of the, of the future. 
that we have the new life within these uh, dying bodies, and that because we have the life within these dying bodies, that when the Lord Jesus returns, the Holy Spirit's going to give us our new bodies, our eternal bodies, that will never die. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And the very fact that we turn from the old life and uh, seek to live in the Spirit uh, shows that we have life. We live forever. But if we continue to live after the flesh, and God uh, doesn't deal with us and uh, doesn't chasten us, well, it's just a, a proof that there never was life there. The Christian one never was born again. He's still living in the flesh. But the born-again uh, Christian, he begins to hate the flesh, hate the old life, and he longs and hungers and cries out to live in the Spirit, to live after the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he grows, there's less and less, less and less sin, and there's more and more righteousness. And he uh, depends less and less upon the flesh, and more and more upon the spirit. Doesn't mean that uh, as a Christian there never will be any uh, living after the flesh, because uh, the growing Christian often depends upon the flesh. He often brings forth the works of sin, works of the flesh. But it, there's a growth there. It isn't his natural bent. It's uh, for that which I would not I do, but what I hate that do I. And it's that attitude for the Christian. doesn't want to do these things. True, sometimes he becomes stubborn, and uh, when he's really walking in the flesh, he, he wants to sin. He sins purposely, and God has to chasten him. God has to child train him. God has to sometimes punish him, but he does it in love. He does it to teach him. And he, uh, he uses all of that to uh, train us and to, to develop us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that's the true hunger of the uh, Christian heart, the new redeemed heart. Uh, he really hungers and yearns to be led of the Holy Spirit, whereas the unsaved man never wants that. He, he may want to do good things for God. He may want to get credit from God for being good, but he, he never has any. He doesn't even know what it means to be led of the Spirit. He doesn't know who the Holy Spirit is. He has no conception. But the true sons of God have a hunger to uh, turn from self and to walk in the Spirit. And verse 15, For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Uh, the spirit of bondage is a law. And uh, the Christian finds out he's not under the law. He doesn't have a spirit of bondage. And the constant fear that he's not walking right and not doing right, the constant fear that the law lays upon him, that he might be lost but we receive the the Holy Spirit who has adopted us, who has caused us to be born again into the family of God. And we cry, Father, dear Father, there's a, there's a childlike uh, reliance upon his own Heavenly Father. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And uh, through the Word of God, we uh, come to believe the Word and we realize that because of what the Word says that we're born again and we're, we belong to our Father eternally. And that we're, we're heirs. We're joint heirs with Christ because we're in Christ and that he's our life. And all that belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ belongs to the Christian. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Well, uh, any, any, any born-again Christian is uh, he's going to suffer with the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to take him through things that he he's going to suffer for his faith. He's going to suffer uh, things that God takes him through. Uh, but it's not a matter of punishment. It's not a matter of God uh, neglecting him. It's uh, all engineered. It's all geared to God's purpose for us, to uh, conform us to the image of his Son. 
And uh, there may be suffering here, but there's going to be glory when he returns, eternal glory. So that uh, what we go through here is just uh, for a moment. It does nothing in comparison to uh, the glory that we'll have with him forever. So that we, we really shouldn't uh, seek to avoid that which he takes us through because it's all uh, has a purpose behind it and it's all geared uh, for a greater glory with him, for his glory. And Paul says in verse 18, For I reckon, I count, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall re be revealed in us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And Paul certainly suffered. Uh, as soon as Paul was born again, uh, God said, uh, I'll show him what great things he must suffer for my namesake. And uh, who, uh, who of us... Uh, has ever gone through anything like what Paul uh, was taken through by God in the realm of suffering. But any old sufferings that we have, they're not. In Paul, all of Paul's terrible sufferings, he says they, they aren't to be compared with the, the glory that will be revealed in, in us. <coughs> well, friends, these are wonderful truths. And then uh, Paul speaks here a bit about uh, the creation, waiting for the manifestation of the glory of the sons of God. And he uh, speaks here in verse 26, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmity. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And uh, we are really to rely upon the Holy Spirit in our prayer life. That when we don't understand uh, how to pray about a thing, we rely upon Him and there's a deep burden within our hearts and a groaning for God's will to be carried out and for guidance from God. And uh, that's the ministry of the Holy Spirit within. He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And the Holy Spirit teaches us how to pray and, and he knows what God's will is and uh, he takes our heart burdens uh, to the Father and he uh, trains us to uh, pray according to the will of God and all of these things uh, these ministries of the Holy Spirit deep within our lives are faithful and uh, true to God and for God's uh, purposes for God's glory, hard as they seem. And this assurance in our wonderful verses 28 and 29. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. And then verse 29 shows us his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And that's, uh, that's our calling. That's what he's called us to, to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the one who is uh, working it out by using all the things in our life to conform, uh, to conform us to his image. And God is for us. He's not against us. No matter how uh, difficult, uh, no matter how hard he has to deal with us and the difficult things he has to take us through, to work out this purpose. He's doing it in love. He's doing it because he's for us, not against us. And uh, since God is for us, then no one can be against us. No one. God turns all these things around and uses them for his glory and to work out his purpose. And that includes Satan. If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered his, him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely, freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? There's no condemnation. Uh, God has justified us. He's not going to lay anything against us. He's already justified us. So who is he that condemneth? Shall Christ that died? Well, the Lord Jesus isn't going to condemn us because he's, uh, he's already redeemed us. And he's risen again. And he's at the right hand of God. And uh, we're in him. And he's, uh, he's there making intercession for us. 
So why uh, why can a Christian be? How can a Christian be upset about the things that God takes him through, and even the things that he finds in his own heart when he realizes all of this, and counts upon it and reckons upon it? Uh, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? And uh, he lists all of these things, and nothing nothing can separate us from the love of the Lord Jesus, because we're we're uh, one with Him. His life and our life have become one. And he he's. Uh, He's not going to, he can't separate, uh, he can't, it's impossible for us to be separated from him. So then verse 7, uh, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. It's not a matter of uh, being all upset because we're taking through things that are for our own good, that we can be conquerors in it all, through it all, when we realize what he's doing. Well, friends, these are very brief statements, and they're just uh, a few thoughts for us to think about as we study these chapters. And uh, <laughs> words, words, uh, how can words really uh, bring out these wonders that are in Romans 8, for instance, or any of these chapters? How can words do it? But yet uh, these words are given to us to... Uh, give us enough that we might uh, praise the Lord, that we might stand in Him and realize what He's done for us and where He's placed us, and that He can be honored through us and manifested through us as we rely upon Him, as we reckon upon uh, what He's done and reckon upon, count upon Him. Our Father, how we praise Thee for Thy Word and for Thy Holy Spirit who uh, teaches us the word and ministers the truth to us in our daily life and daily walk. Wilt thou give us patience as we wait upon thee to more and more definitely make these things true in our daily lives, that we might experience them as we reckon upon the fact that thou hast already completed these things for us in the Lord Jesus, who is our life. We trust thee for this in Jesus' name. Amen.